As we continue the uh, College of Architecture and Planning guest lecture program, we're pleased this evening to be able to uh, bring to uh, Ball State's campus a faculty colleague from another institution in our own state, from Rose Holman Institute down in uh, Terre Haute, Indiana. Although she's flying here by way of San Antonio, Texas, where she's presently um, based. Patricia Carlson currently an Air Force University resident researcher at the Human Resources Laboratory Intelligence Systems Branch of Brooks Air Force Base in Texas. She's conducting research on the integration of intelligent hypertext systems in neural networks. From 89 to 90, she was a National Research Council senior associate assigned to the same facility. She did her undergraduate work at the College of William and Mary and received her MA and PhD degrees from Duke University. Her current areas of interest include hypertext as a form of knowledge representation and AI, artificial intelligence applications in the areas of knowledge management systems. She's also interested in intelligent tutoring systems. And just before coming here this evening, we were talking at dinner about tutoring models, which sound very similar to those that we use in studios. She's also interested in virtual world technology. Dr. Carlson has been the recipient of several American Society for Engineering Education, National Aeronautic and Space Administration fellowships, during which she studied computers and the composing process, as well as electronic publication. She's also received grants for research in text-based technology from the U.S. Air Force. She's traveled widely and, in fact, looks to have quite a busy uh, year, uh, both in 91 and in 92. She'll be heading to Nova Scotia to lecture and participate in workshops at the Acadia University. She has in the past served as a Fulbright professor at uh, the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. And she'll be traveling uh, soon to Russia, where she'll be conducting some workshops and participating in some educational exchange there. It's with great pleasure that the Energy Center is able to jointly sponsor uh, Dr. Patricia Carlson for this evening's lecture. Dr. Carlson. for that very fine introduction. Uh, as you can see, um, as is the government's want, we have, since I sent your materials to you, we've changed our name. We're now the Armstrong Laboratory. Uh, it's still the same organization. It's just that if we don't change our name every six months, we're afraid someone will find us. Uh, I am with the Intelligent Systems Branch, which builds prototype intelligent tutors in Air Force domains. Primarily, these prototype tutors are still in a test bed phase so that the branch likes to get clients um, that will feel the tutor and then allow us to do evaluation so that we can prove that, in fact, these tutors are as effective as individual um, classroom instruction. And so far, the data indicates that the tutors are doing at least as good a job as a human tutor, and in many cases, uh, a better job. Most of the tutors that are currently being built are in a process domain that is something that can be simulated rather easily and something that has a set of rules that can be captured without a great deal of difficulty. Uh, for example, certain kinds of aircraft maintenance, which can be simulated uh, on a computer screen without a great deal of difficulty. Uh, I was brought in to look at a very different kind of domain, a domain that would deal with much more fuzzy logic and a domain that would have uh, more difficulty in developing a simulation, and that would be reading and writing. In other words, how do you simulate what you're doing when you're reading? Because in point of fact, it is a kind of covert uh, or internalized cognitive process. <clears throat> 
So what I want to talk to you about today would be uh, hypermedia. And uh, let's see. Okay, we're fine. What I want to talk to you about today is hypermedia and the potential that I believe hypermedia, or I'll call it hypertext, will have for developing the kind of knowledge base that it will take for some of these fuzzy domains such as reading and writing. And in doing this talk, I also want to indicate that I think that we're certainly on the verge of um, developing a new kind of literacy, or at least a new way of doing things, once we're able to field a number of these hypermedia systems. Almost 550 years ago, Gutenberg supposedly serendipitous connection between the mechanism of a wine press and the function of a signet ring produced movable type. And the world was on the way to the information age. According to scholars, and this has been um, investigated rather thoroughly by a number of communication scholars, such as uh, Harold Ennis and the one that you've probably heard of is Marshall McLuhan or Father Walter Ong. According to these scholars, humankind has given up a great deal in exchange for this textuality. In other words, a literate culture typically tends to think of itself as somehow being more advanced than an oral culture. But in going back and looking at some of the ways of knowing, uh, Marshall McLuhan and Father Walter Ong suggest that we may be uh, overemphasizing our own capabilities. Um, Pre-literate cultures actively construct meaning from all the central stimuli, and they rely more extensively on intuition and impression over logic and analysis, whereas a literate culture relies more on um, sight and the ability to read, and this comes to dominate until a kind of rational, logical way of knowing typically becomes almost pathologically efficient. In other words, we can read very, very quickly and we can absorb information at uh, an incredible amount of speed. Uh, if we're looking at vis-a-vis -vis an oral culture, but in many cases we may not truly understand on the same level as an oral culture. I think it's useful here to just stop and think a bit about these differences. Uh, in an oral culture, the process of meaning is far different. Um, they lack artifacts with which to record a sequential thought, and therefore they're more process-oriented than a literate culture. In other words, there's a dimension of performance and there's a dimension of a kind of ritualistic um, behavior between listener and between hearer. And more typically, there's a dialogue that takes place. Uh, and certainly the, the element of vocalization is important in an oral culture. Whereas in our culture, we've almost become a kind of silent uh, ingestion, uh, ingesting of information. Uh, which McLuhan certainly thought was abnormal, that in reading, we go off into a library and typically sit alone for long periods of time and sort of consume mass quantities of information. And McLuhan found that to be a bit abnormal as far as uh, the making of meaning. Um, certainly patterns of meaning in oral and literate cultures are far different. In an oral culture, you'll find more narration and more description as being the predominant discourse patterns, whereas in a literate culture, you'll find analysis and argumentation being more the uh, dominant patterns. Permanence in an oral culture is equivalent to being remembered, and therefore you need to facilitate your transmission through storyline or some kind of mnemonic devices. Permanence in a literate culture is equivalent to being accepted and therefore you need to develop a well-organized thesis and present it through a tightly knit argument, including evidence and an adherence to a preconceived set of forms, conventions of forms. And also provenance of meaning. In other words, how do we know what the truth is is far different in an oral culture than it is in a literate culture. An oral culture really has no concept of accuracy or originality or of plagiarism. Truth is really a social concept. It's a commitment of belief. Whereas in a print culture, we typically have a more rational requirement as to what constitutes 
truth and that we've learned these things through the underpinnings of the Western tradition of science, such as comparison and validation of data, context independent forms of reasoning, comparison contrast, for example, or the accumulative tradition of scholarship. When one writes a paper, one goes to the library and collects information on what someone else has already said so that you're not reinventing the wheel, whereas in an oral culture that simply doesn't exist. So what I'm saying is that there's a very different kind of um, pattern of the making of meaning in these two different cultures. Today, when we say literacy, we mean skill in reading and writing. And this proficiency is commonly the product of several years of formalized special schooling with a tremendous commitment on the part of both students and teachers to the value of being literate. Okay? Because it's a, very, it, it's a tremendous undertaking to become literate in a print technology. However, and I think anyone who has blood running through his or her veins will agree with me on this, we really seem to be in the, mid, in the midst of a potentially dangerous split between those who participate in traditional literacy and those who really cannot or choose not to participate in literacy. Uh, in fact, there was a study done about three years ago that pointed out that we typically talk in terms of our tremendous problem with the illiterate. We have a, a more significant but silent problem with the illiterate, people who, who can read and who can write but simply choose not to for one reason or another. So clearly the current ways in which we're dealing with these skills tend to be failing a significant portion of the population. And though it's not traditionally defined in these two ways, I'd like to think in terms of maybe uh, resuscitating some of the verbiage that Marshall McLuhan used and saying that we may have a difference here between what Marshall McLuhan called the print technology person, the typographic man, and the more socially, orally oriented person or more tribal man. It almost looks like there are some uh, interesting comparison contrasts that could be made with those two. My claim, however, is that <clears throat> no matter which of these we have at any given time, neither one is going to have the intellectual skills to survive in a knowledge age. The Print technology's ways of dealing with things presents too narrow a bandwidth. You simply cannot deal with the amount of material coming out if you are a classic traditional reader. And the oral technology, the oral culture's uh, ways of dealing with information depends upon an immediacy and intuition, and it simply won't allow for adequate reflection or interpretation. So both of those things tend to be necessary, but not particularly strong points of an oral tradition. Uh, what I'm going to suggest in this is that uh, Marshall McLuhan, <clears throat> who would have rejoiced in this degeneration of text, because he would have seen it as a harbinger of something new and different, may have been absolutely right, that we may be on the verge of a paradigm shift, and that paradigm shift may in fact be a hypermedia environment. Hypermedia, or hypertext, <clears throat> is variously characterized as nonlinear prose, interactive print, or dynamic text. It uses electronic capabilities to overcome the limitations of linear printed text. And up here I have a kind of generic hypertext system uh, with a view from outside the skin. What we're looking at here would be what the individual viewer might see. And in point of fact, we'll have some text on the screen. Here, it's a sort of traditional representation. Uh, what we have is a footnote or a reference. I click on that in some way magically. Not only the reference appears, but also the reference appears in context so that I can then check on whether it was misquoted. I can check on the surroundings. I can get all kinds of the, the cues that were in the original text from which this was taken. I also over here have two forms of graphical browsers, which are absolutely essential. You'll notice here this represents both um, the power and, I think, the misfortune of a hypermedia environment in that we can continue to click on these things so that you can start out reading about Admiral Nimitz and end up reading about the history of ballet if you just, you know, sort of just kind of intellectual grazing across this field and free associate it so that you need some way in which you can track and understand what the nature of the environment is and where you are at a given time. This one um, develops the links, shows the links 
that are available in the system, and this one is tracking where we are at a given time. This is not representative of any, of any individual system. It's simply showing the capability or the potential. Inside, we have a database, which is simply a group of nodes that have been linked. And in the better systems, what I think are the, the systems that are going to point the way toward the better hypermedia uh, instantiations, these links can be typed. I think if you don't have typed links, uh, that you have tremendously degraded the system. Well, what I mean by types is that if I have linked something, I can tag it as having been made by Pat Carlson on a given day, or I can link it as having a particular relationship with the node, or I can even have what are called warm links, links that send information from one node to another, or I can have virtual links, links that are only uh, evolved or generated at a specific time. So that the hard link systems, while they're what we have and they're available in the commercial software, in many cases are a very inhibited and kind of uh, hampered form of hypermedia. So what I'm talking about now may not exist on the commercial market, but they're more than just lab toys. Uh, they're being developed by a number of large software houses who won't tell you about them simply because they're interested in, in um, product uh, secrecy and keeping their, their product uh, commercially viable. But they're just about to have, I think, within the next year, a number of really interesting rollouts in these areas which give us just a lot more potential for hypermedia. Okay, here again, here's what we'd see. We'd see the hot spots or the links, and typically we click on them when we bring up some kind of other information. Now, the more interesting part is that we have in this area a kind of 3D information environment. If we have now typed links, and we have nodes that maybe also carry with them some kind of correspondent report on what they contain, then we can sort and filter this information. We can also reorganize it so that this internal representation may then be brought up for an individual user in four different representations. I'm thinking in terms of once I was um, looking at some Air Force aircraft manuals and the inter introductory manual for some repair technology is called safing the plane. And in that, you go around and you simply shut everything down so that before you touch something, there isn't anything that's on there that's actually live and working so that you don't you know, trip the ejection seat and smash yourself on the canopy or something. But this thing was organized alphabetically. Okay. Well, that meant you could be in the cockpit doing one thing, and then your next step, you're out messing around on the wheels, okay? Or you might be crawling in and out. I mean, obviously, that knowledge representation was designed for the convenience of the custodian of the information and not the consumer of the information. And in fact, it's very difficult to, to say exactly how individual users would like to use that information. Some technicians, like to save all the electronics first, and then they go to the hydraulics. Some like to work with specific sets of tools and then go to another set of tools. And so in point of fact, a hypermedia system would allow you to customize that manual and bring up that list, that organizational uh, representation in any way the user wanted. So that, that I think, is the, the, the value of hypermedia and something that we certainly haven't seen. Uh, in most of our paper copy, because paper copy has a, a kind of invariant information delivery interface. Just a tiny bit about the history of hypertext. It's not a new concept at all. This may be surprising. It's kind of a, a, an idea whose technology has come rather than an idea whose time has come. It was first proposed by Vannevar Bush, who was President Roosevelt's science advisor. And Vannevar Bush had a number of interesting projects to keep him busy, such as the ENIAC project or the Manhattan project. But he's especially concerned that the momentum that science had gained during the war not be squandered in a peacetime sort of uh, downsizing. 
And he also realized that there was a tremendous information explosion and that scientists were doing a lot of reinventing of knowledge structures that might have been available in an, um, someone else's mind, but not particularly accessible. So in a way, he was kind of fantasizing about electronic brains. If you get a chance to read this article, I think it's very interesting in that the technology is very quaint. I mean, it was 1945, the dry cell photography. It was um, microfilm, and he had some kind of elect um, electromechanical device whereby you could tag things and link different sections of the frames, and this electromechanical device would keep track of what you were doing. Uh, and that is, is again, it's kind of nostalgic and, and maybe just a little bit funny in the way it's presented. But what he had to say about what he wanted to do with that technology is absolutely up to date. There isn't a better piece of information that tells you about hypertext because he knew exactly, he wanted a peripheral brain. Uh, in many ways, I think he anticipated uh, expert systems because he talked in terms of once you've pre-threaded these pieces of information, you could in fact sell them. Lawyers, for example, that have to go through tremendous numbers of case studies might in fact sell those trails to other lawyers who were doing exactly the same kinds of work. So he really, I think, anticipated a lot of what it is that we have um, still as our goals in a hypermedia environment. Doug Engelbart, you may know in a different context, he's the man who invented the mouse working at Berkeley, uh, was very much interested in alternative input devices and actually was the first uh, person to have mouse-driven systems. And his information, again, is absolutely uh, up to date on his expectations for hypermedia. It's just that we don't have the technology there. It is an augmentation to the mind. It's a way in which we sit at a tremendous design board and we represent concepts and ideas and we, we reify them. We make them uh, whole and we make them concrete to the point that we can touch them and we can move them around. And so these processes of the mind that were opaque and hard to understand because it took place in the mind itself, now become something that can be externalized and we can manipulate them to become objects and they can be understood by the manager of that information. Uh, Ted Nelson uh, actually term, gave us the term hypertext in the late 60s, early 70s. He's still very much working in the field. He is very much the guru of hypertext. And I think because he's been such a devoted advocate and such an avid spokesman that he's really sort of been responsible, at least at, we've had many people lay at his door the whole idea of the hype of hypermedia. Because his idea is a universal, global information environment. Okay? And all this information is addressable right down to the individual bit so that you sit at your console, and if you want to call up any piece of information that exists in the entire world, you have access to it. He has also uh, made a, uh, a kind of commitment to the fact that, yes, people have uh, <clears throat> ownership of ideas, so how do we pay for the use of this material? He has a kind of metering system, so you're going to pay for this. Just the, It's a utility, in other words. You'll pay for it just like you'll pay for the water bill or you'll pay for the phone bill. Uh, it's... His project, Xanadu, has been in production for about 25 years. Uh, it is, again, I guess the most anxiously awaited piece of software, uh, but still such a tremendous project that um, people either take him as being something of a guru and a little bit too flashy, or they take him as someone who's really on the, the cutting edge of where hypertext ought to be and just simply can't be because we don't have the, the materials to implement it. Okay, well, <clears throat> we need to make the case against paper text, then. If you're going to trade media, if you're talking about, well, we really ought to be doing it in a different way, that's a tremendous expectation to tell people to give up books. Okay. And I'm not saying give up literature, and I'm not saying give up certain forms of philosophical essays, and I'm not saying give, it, give up the classics. What I'm talking about here is information that's typically the type of thing that's contained in a textbook. Expository prose whose function and purpose is to transmit information rather than to entertain, rather than to, to 
delight, something that works through structure perhaps more than style. Not that textbooks don't have a style, but typically they don't have what you call a very pleasant or entertaining style. So I'm talking more in terms of expository prose. So the case against paper. Actually, what we have are square books. Uh, it's amazing how the design and form of a book hasn't changed over you know, basically its whole history. Paper text, or flat text, provides only two dimensions of information. It's linear or it's hierarchical. You think about this, you read sentences linearly, or you have information structures that are very much like a table of contents. They're hierarchically ordered. Uh, some paragraphs are hierarchically ordered, and within them would be a linear dimension of the system. Hypertext, the argument goes, more closely models the deep structure of human idea processing by creating a network of nodes and links. And this allows for this multidimensional navigation through a body of data. A little bit later, I'll talk about semantic nets and how uh, cognitive psychologists are pretty sure that we store information, not necessarily hierarchically, but in a web of associations. For example, if I said apple, that should trigger in your mind several different associations. It could trigger something to eat, it could trigger a computer, it could trigger an identic myth, a, a biblical story. But in, in other words, that word itself, that node, is linked to a number of different things. And which node fires is very much dependent upon the situation. So if they all fired at once, you certainly have difficulties and probably need to to uh, see, seek out some kind of counseling. But in any case, that's typically how we're storing these things and how we regulate the firing is a situationally induced uh, frame. The rigid structure of text is certainly, I think, another area that we, we need to, to take a look at if we're going to make a case against flat text. It's certainly brittle in the sense that um, most people have an inability or a reluctance to decompose a book, either logically or physically. We typically don't rip up our books, and many people don't know how logically to rip up a book. Expert readers typically do know how to extract information. If you watch an expert reader, they have a kind of uh, individualized markup language. They make notes, or they take keywords, or they build little graphs or little structures on the side so that in reconstructing that information and going back and studying, let's say, for example, they have these mnemonic devices or methods by which they have taken the knowledge footprint of the book and turned it into a knowledge footprint that's very much their own. So a book has strengths in that it gives order and permanence, but it certainly has weaknesses in that this organizational schema is generic. Now, a lot of textbooks have a great deal of design that's gone into them to try to help many different people use the same information. However, this generic view is really going to remain just that. The current no notion of course delivery, of course, is to use a textbook augmented by hands-on laboratories or uh, supplemented by lectures, but I think the book itself has a, has a de-skilling emphasis in that it is an expert's opinion, it's an expert's view, and we treat it as almost a sequential kinds of thing. It's very seldom someone counsels you to try to do the problems at the end of the chapter before you've read the chapter. It's very seldom that you even start in the middle of a textbook. So this whole idea of a kind of sequential organization is very much built into the design of a book. Okay, well the case that the hypermedia people are making is that if we move to hypermedia, we gain a lot of things. First, we gain this flexibility and ease of use. Presenting the text as an associational network rather than a monolithic sequential structure would encourage exploration and reordering, dynamic reordering. So I don't know about you, but a lot of times when I've been reading a textbook, trying to understand the concepts, later in the book or in the course, something makes it very clear to me what it was I was trying to learn in the first few chapters. And I think in terms of, well, gee, if I'd have known this first, all of the rest of that would have been just that much easier. So I've augmented my kind of cognitive map. There's no way to predict 
individual learners' preferred methods. Well, you can do it kind of generically. You can set up categories of preferred learning styles. But really, an individual needs to be able to explore, to investigate, to reorder information, to reinterpret, to recontextualize. So, recontextualize. So, this um, hypermedia argument that this nodes and links will allow us to do that. Um, because learners are going to spend more time processing the deep structure of the information, they will improve their conceptual understanding of the domain. Um, again, this, some of these things are debatable because explorative learning typically is a very high cost kind of learning. Hopefully it will increase motivation. The learner is now in control of the process, not the book being in control of, in control of you, but you're in control of the process. And so you can seek out alternative and perhaps even idiosyncratic ways in which you can learn this information. Well, so the argument goes. Now let's talk a little bit more about what this might do for us. I think it would set up some new habits of mind. Elizabeth Eisenstein, in 1979, did a tremendous two-volume study called The Press as Agent of Social Change. And she went back and she looked at Gutenberg and the whole evolution of text and what that had done. And she did a very scholarly study. She's kind of a companion to McLuhan, but McLuhan was very much impressionistic, and Eisenstein builds her arguments through evidence. I mean, McLuhan had gotten himself into a box because he was trying to argue against the existence of books, and the only way he could get that idea out was through a book. So he wrote what was considered a non-book. It, it wasn't sequential, it wasn't organized, it wasn't an argument. People didn't know how to take him, and so typically he's, he's taken as being a bit flaky. But Eisenstein is a true scholar, and she goes through this whole thing. Her conclusion is that the printing press brought us the habits of mind that brought about two significant changes, one of which was the Western tradition of science, the scientific revolution of the 17th and 16th centuries, and the Protestant Reformation. And she goes through and does a very respectable job. Widespread dissemination of books, for example, introduced new methods of information handling. And while they might look trivial to us because we've had so much experience, they were new for people who had not seen very much information pool in any given space. Well-stocked bookshelves led directly to comparisons, to contradictions, to indexing, and referencing. In other words, you might think that this dispersal of information would mean that there was a kind of uniformity and that, you know, uh, that things went outward. But what happened was once enough information started to pool, people had alternative opinions. And once you have alternative opinions in text, then you need to start developing the mechanisms by which you can judge which could be true and which might not be true. So very much this kind of medium developed the mental habits that then led to the Western tradition of rationalism. Now, it seems to me that we could posit that <clears throat> if we have a new medium, a truly new medium, that we will probably develop new traditions and new habits of mind. In traditional reading, the expert learner has to, the expert reader has to extract a knowledge structure from the book, okay? So that you may have a hierarchical organization in your mind, you can remember what happens sentence by sentence, perhaps not that fine grain, but chapter by chapter, surely, paragraph by paragraph, you might have a sense of what was developed. But you'll also have an associational net that may trigger concepts, semantic networks that say, oh yes, I remember this was mentioned, and how does that match up with something that was said far later in the book? So we, we extract that at great cost, and then we're able to manipulate it. Weak readers, Weak learners typically have very hard times doing that. If we can develop a machine whereby those structures are held in a kind of virtual text for us and available on demand, then we put ourselves on this other side of this tremendous burden and the whole knowledge environment changes and now we have ways to restructure on demand so that we can now, I think, have ways in which we can emulate the skills of an expert 
reader. We can skim, scan, thumb, we can extract this meaning. We have a wider repertoire from manipulating the features of design. For example, estimating a knowledge footprint just from the format, being able to use layout cues, fast lookup routines. We can integrate text with graphics much more easily in these new systems, which now automate a great deal of this for us. So that what it does is it takes the rigor, takes the, the burden out, and allows us to operate at a level of abstraction where learning really becomes fun. Now it's kind of neat to recontextualize, to, to kind of try out different orders, to kind of um, take a look at the knowledge structure from the point of view of an expert. In many ways, you can see that this change is coming about by the ways in which we've changed the ways we talk about these things. Information now has become more of an environment. Okay, so information is an environment. Um, certainly, the language of hypermedia is steeped in visuospatial tactile implications. Collections of information become pools of information. Users navigate through these. I mean, we go home and talk about reading a textbook, whereas in hypermedia, you navigate through a pool of information. Content becomes a knowledge space, and these ideas are objects that you can glean and manipulate. You take tours through a knowledge environment. You make your own path. You walk through the information. These metaphors really clearly indicate that there's a much more tactile and perhaps more oral uh, typical of an oral culture, way in which we're dealing with this information. Even such things as synesthesia or describing one sensory experience in terms of another start to abound in the way we talk about hyperworlds. Um, we have such things as muscle memory. Some of the hypermedia experimental systems are driven by data gloves, and you might reach out and turn something that's actually not there. It's in a virtual environment. But now instead of committing it to a kind of brain memory. It's a mus muscular memory. And we also have a, a gestural utterance. And so it's almost as if speech becomes uh, a non-entity in this process. I want to be careful here, though, in, in insisting that what I see as the new literacy will still be a text-based literacy. Um, I think that we've spent far too long becoming typographical man. We spent 500 years doing that. We certainly spent 5,000 years becoming a text literate culture uh, to abandon paper. And to do that would be a kind of book burning that I don't think we're prepared to do. Plus, a uh, more pragmatic argument, I think the estimates are that 98% of the world's knowledge is uh, represented in a book somewhere. And so the tremendous retrofitting of these books, while it is a problem, would be our primary source of information. But I do think that this hypermedia environment gives us a tremendous new way of dealing with the information. And I'm just going to give you four words that become kind of the key words for the rest of the speech. Um, the, the heuristics, the powerful strategies, the empowerment that this new medium may give us. First is the association that it gives us, this uh, information as chunks, which have then been linked which becomes some kind of gestalt. They become the, the whole becomes more than the sum of the parts. Uh, things that perhaps are more typical of uh, a relation, relational order database or object-oriented database or entity relation database, a, a higher level of ways in which we can look at information through association. I think the abstraction makes it clear that just like a human being um, who develops concepts from, extra from feature extraction, we can also allow our information to represent in data, to, to represent knowledge on different levels of representation so that we can augment the concept of a cognitive map and we can look at things at a very high level of abstraction and then follow that chain, that leak right down through the data on any given thread. So you can move upwards and downwards, kind of doing deductive and inductive logic uh, and, and being very much aware of what it is that you're doing at any given time because, again, these objects are going to be reified. They're objectified for us. I think the plasticity is also another thing. That, um, 
a lot of people are very good working with their hands and they like to be able to manipulate things. They like to be able to see things that are on the table and to get some kind of concrete objective correlative for what it is that they're thinking about. And this idea of performance, which is also a part, I think, of the oral culture, uh, returns to us when we move over to the medium of hypermedium. Uh, and again, my last one was the performance value, this idea of acting out something, of making something that was obscure very much a kind of um, observable feature. So let me go on then to talk in terms of five issues, five areas of cognition that I think will be a part of this new literacy. Uh, if you want to go ahead and put that other slide up. Same thing. I'm going to leave this one up here so you can kind of track me on my illustrations or examples. Again, I'm not giving specific examples because my point is not here to talk about specific projects or specific products, but to simply talk about some of the nature of how changing the media will change our cognitive ways of knowing and perhaps give us these new habits of mind, such as Elizabeth Eisenstein uh, has chronicled for us with the advent of print. First one is with knowledge structures. Expert learners have very powerful strategies for gaining intellectual control over a body of seemingly discrete data. Though the exact nature of these strategies they use is very much domain driven, in essence, experts can be aware of associational patterns in data. And at the same time, they can organize the data into progressively higher levels of abstraction. Novices have only impoverished strategies for doing this, and they tend not to be able to synthesize patterns very well. They tend to work on a very low level of detail, a novice in a given field, and they, they get easily frustrated because they're working in, in a kind of trivial um, domain in which there's a high cognitive overload. They get overwhelmed by the details. They can't actually see the forest for having worked the trees to just use that cliche. They don't really make much use of their time. They frequently um, become embedded in a kind of tight loop, and they really can't perceive ways in which they can move back out of their um, patterns and, and uh, kind of satisfy us or make a new um, arrangement on how to do things. Again, if we're presenting the information with these type links and we have the three-dimensional area, we can, in fact, give a graphical overview of what the information is and follow each of those higher level concepts right down to its individualized link. Or we could start the other way around. We could use a bottom up kind of strategy and we could move from the lower level information up through the higher levels. So that these browsers that are available in a hypermedia system, and here's one that represents both uh, an associational level as well as a hierarchical level. Now these could be individualized nodes that are represented in the same, in, in both of the uh, knowledge representations, but be exactly the same node. So in other words, on one level I could have my apple, which is uh, then triggering all kinds of uh, semantic associations, and then on the other side I could have, let's say, like the organizational chart of an apple sales office or something. So that I've got the same node, but represented in two entirely different kind of frames of reference for myself. And I can see how that's working very clearly. Such meta views really help uh, the user see these patterns much more readily and to manipulate those patterns. What I think is interesting about the hypermedia environments is that they're of use not only to the students, but they're of use to teachers also. In good teaching, some of the things we try to do would be to have an understanding of what the student already knows, and then to try to present an overview of what the domain is. And this is a, a, a very much a kind of Robert Gagné systems approach that you present an overview, and then kind of progressively enrich that domain. It's very difficult to know where an individual student is on any given 
domain or, ear, or subset of that domain. So that to develop a diagnostic device from a hypermedia environment would be very, very beneficial. So in this one, we sort of have hypermedia as a mind tool. And what it is is the student sits down and weaves his web. Um, again, it's generic to the point that it doesn't have a specific application. But let's say you give the student a particular problem to do particular assignment in reading, a particular uh, writing assignment, or a particular uh, mathematical project, that initial representation there is a micro world. It's, it's a, a graphical simulation, a representation that has a well-defined number of moves. And so the student then is working through uh, the software, which then collects the data and then weaves a pattern or web, which then can be looked at by the teacher and perhaps um, evaluated based on other uh, more beneficial or, or uh, more uh, reliable kinds of webs so that you can diagnose where that student is on any given problem. What are the mistakes, what, what are the misconceptions the student seems to have made, and what does that indicate about what he needs to know? So it's almost like overlaying these different webs and collecting that information. Um, that becomes a tremendously useful device in trying to see um, how it is that a student perceives the information in the course, and it's not always as easy as it might be. Um, teachers need to have feedback on how they're doing at any given time, and this is a representation of a, a kind of score sheet that Ruth Day, uh, Department of Psychology at Duke University, uses. At the end of her course, she gives a list of keywords that she thinks have been covered in the course, and she asks students to re-represent those keywords in kind of semantic nets. In other words, to take something, what was a central idea, and then what were some things that were related to it? And not to do it hierarchically, but to do a kind of flow chart or a kind of state change diagram. Uh, then she goes back. And she represents these things um, through a kind of data reduction by noting how many students have linked different concepts. And this is pretty much just like the mileage charts that would be in um, maps or something. So what she gets is a kind of overview, a composite of how all the students understood the connectivity or the interrelationship of concepts in the course. And it's very easy to see, for example, if uh, a relatively large portion of the class saw that concept M was related to concept C, and that in fact matched your own map, that's what you were trying to teach, that you had been relatively successful. Now, if, for example, uh, there was one student that matched uh, concept B with concept D, and you hadn't taught that, and in fact they don't match, you can make this distinction that you that person have a clue about what went on in the class. This is an incredibly bright student who's come up with a new insight into the way the course should be organized. But again, a kind of non-intrusive way in which one can collect this information. Now, she does this by hand. I think in other ways, there are other, would be other ways in which it could be automated. So, knowledge structures. Another way to look at what hypermedia will do for us is through access. Certainly bodies of data don't have much meaning if you can't get into them. Medieval manuscripts, for example, were compendia of data, a compendium of text. They were just bound together by circumstances rather than what was actually in them. So they didn't want to waste the vellum, and so when you finished one text, you just continue on with another. Uh, traditionally, there was no cataloging system. Some owners of these manuscripts might construct an index, or there might be other devices for access, but usually they were highly individualized or highly idiosyncratic. Uh, sometimes an enterprising scholar might have tabs that would indicate where one text began and another text ended. But there's certainly nothing comparable to what we would consider to be uh, professional cataloging or consistent cataloging of information. Uh, today, if you look at some of the uh, large databases, um, you'll see that uh, while we do have a significant amount of technological help, sometimes the query, especially in the huge databases such as, D such as Dialog or uh, NASA's Recon, uh, may not necessarily be much better. That's kind of an overstatement. But the, some estimates say that on these huge databases, you'll get back approximately 50% of the material in there that would have really helped you. And of the things you get, 50% of what you get 
isn't anything that you really need. So that there's a relatively low percentage on these huge database kinds of things. Um, trying to, to work in ways that we'd have better uh, access to information brings us to the, the notion of whether or not this hyperweb, once we've threaded the nodes and we've typed them, do they not then become something far different, something that's much more analogous to an AI formalist to a semantic net? Um, let me just tell you a little bit about semantic net. As you can see here, uh, semantic nets were like a lot of computer architecture had nothing to do with computers originally. They were, the concept was originated by a man named Quillian in the 60s, and he was interested in trying to discover how humans organize information and store it in memory. And he used this idea of a uh, semantic net to do tests, and he could actually do, test the latency. For example, if he gave you one concept that he felt relatively sure you'd have to go through another node to get at, he could test to see how long it took you. And he had a lot of statistical measurements to show how complex these cognitive webs might be in the individual mind. And again, it's all a process of how do you measure something when you can't actually see it. You have to do it by some kind of representation. And so the semantic nets became very popular at the time. Uh, they were then uh, taken over by the AI community because it's a way of representing information by a concept and its relationship. And it becomes a way in which a knowledge base can now reason about its own content. Because you, you can see in this very simplistic one that I have, uh, you can actually draw from it the syllogism a cat is a mammal and is bigger than a mouse. Garfield is a cat, therefore, Garfield is a mammal and is bigger than a mouse. Uh, I don't know if anybody here has heard about the Psych Project at MCC. It's a huge multi million dollar, uh, multi year process in which a machine is being taught through a semantic net uh, enough information to emulate the intelligence of probably a 13 to 14 year old. I don't know if they've actually put an age, an age on it, but it's a relatively sophisticated machine that reasons through semantic nets. So it knows a lot about biology, it knows a lot about trees. That was the original thing they entered into it. And it can actually answer questions. It knows, for example, what a tree is. A tree has a root structure. So you can say, can a tree walk? And it'll come back and say something to the effect of, well, no, a tree can't walk because in, in my information, a tree doesn't have feet. It knows enough about those concepts that it can, can in some ways, structure and devise information. So this is where I think hypermedia now starts to get exciting because really if it becomes a cheap way to develop an AI system, if you can get enough knowledge out of that knowledge base to drive a tutor, then you really don't have to go through uh, some of the tremendous expense uh, of developing the knowledge base vis-a-vis -vis a content expert, the knowledge acquisition and the knowledge engineering process that it traditionally involves in developing AI. More importantly, once we've got the semantic net, we can peel off graphical representation so that we can have concept roadmaps. Now we can start doing accessing of information in far different ways from the traditional lexicon string search kinds of things that we do. Now we can ask for concepts rather than content. For example, in a genealogy, asking for the earliest male node with the fewest numbers of sons and daughter links would probably produce the name of the first confirmed bachelor in that family. So that you can think in, of ideas as far as there being like relationships. And you can ask, is this relationship in here somewhere? Find those nodes, click on them, and go down to the textual representation. So it's, it's semantic navigation versus a kind of lexical navigation. It's a far different way of getting at information. I think it empowers us in different ways and teaches us how to see information in far different uh, representations. Problem exploration tools. There are a number of different areas in which hypermedia is being used as a tool by which we can um, emulate the heuristics and, and, and um, the strategies that an expert might bring to a particular domain. Some of them are being used in case environments. The ones that I would be more, most interested in, the ones I have most knowledge about, are in writing environments. Um, 
typically these are huge, well-funded environments, and they can develop a prototype, which um, will not be available, let's say, for public consumption for maybe two to three more years. But there are some smaller ones that I can tell you about um, that I think will be on the market within a, within a, a space of about 12 months. Um, one of the earliest, and perhaps still better, is uh, the writing environment done by John B. Smith at Chapel Hill. And he had a very simple cognitive model. It's very eloquent in its simplicity. He said if we're in reading, we go from a linear structure, and then we kind of devise a hierarchical order that makes sense to us. Uh, and then we store it in our brain in an associational format. So he said there's really three knowledge representations, transformations that we have to go through in reading. So we've got it in our brain in an association bring it out and we have to bring it out in a hierarchical because if you just gave somebody your association map it would only, wouldn't make much sense. We cannot use those knowledge structures in our normal workday world because now we don't know how, we, we simply don't have the facility to, to be able to extract knowledge from someone else's associational net with some, without some kind of interpreter. So he said if that's reading then writing must be the, the opposite. And yeah, I mean it sounds simplistic but in some ways, it really kind of works. If you think about your own writing process, uh, if you remember that most of the beginning stuff is like, like doodling and sketching or writing disconnected notes or all the kinds of little flotsam and jetsam that seem to come through your mind. Uh, a lot of people do it in different ways. or sort of an idiosyncratic way in which people do it. But we're churning through these associational nets looking for relevancy. Okay, and once we've collected those things, then we start to transform them into the hierarchical structure that we can share with other people. Now, there are hypermedia specialists that insist that we will get to the point that we can share these associational nets, okay, and that we won't have to go into this more uh, print-dominated hierarchical form. And I think we really did get that print, uh, that hierarchical format. Uh, and the, the kind of conventions that we developed through print uh, from Gutenberg. I think that's a part of our, uh, our literacy that we may or may not shed. Uh, for my argument, it's irrelevant, and for John Smith's argument, it's irrelative, irrelevant because he wants to produce a written paper, and all this is is a knowledge work board. It's rather like the kind of storyboards that some people use to gain intellectual control. And again, his environment looks very much like the ones that I've previously shown you. You can work at one space and do your associational kinds of things, which will then allow you, each of these nodes can be clicked on, and there's text underneath it. So you can do a kind of graphical editing. You can, you can develop an association, and then you can go over and you can change and re-represent and try to work it out in various ways on the hierarchy organization. This is another one that's done at the University of Darmstadt, and I've only read the literature on this one, but this is certainly a much more ambitious project in that it's using the Toulmin model for argumentation, and the Toulmin model is a very specific way in which one makes meaning in that you have a piece of datum or an observation which then leads you to a claim. And this claim is valid only because it has a warrant. And then typically you need to anticipate the rebuttal so that you can answer an audience. And there's the rebuttal. The people at Darmstadt have added this backing as their own variation. So what it is is a set of templates by which you develop your argument by being continually counseled on what you need to put in here. The interesting thing about this one is that it is an intelligent tutor. Okay? It knows what you've put. It knows where you're missing information. It can assist because it doesn't do natural language processing. It can assess the quality of your argumentation, but it knows when things are missing. So these problem-solving spaces, I think, have a lot of utility, and we'll probably see more of these coming out. Uh, the ones I'm going to talk about next have <clears throat> some similarities. It's just that now more than one person's at this drawing board for knowledge and their collaborative environments. Uh, McLuhan regretted most the kind of social making of meaning. He thought that this perverse notion of going off to a library and reading uh, was a way in which we'd simply um, sealed our, our brains in wax and that in point of fact 
we ought to be developing ways in which we could work together. And that's become much more of a popular model, I think, today because of the uh, incredible success of the Japanese. But it's also, I think, a, a, a truly useful notion in that many professions do require that people work together in design teams, that most of the large projects today simply cannot be handled by a single individual. So it would be useful if these people could work in some kind of uh, environment that would be productive. This is um, <clears throat> a system, just a, a kind of schematic representation of a system that's done at MCC. They use it for their software design projects. Um, in other words, uh, a committee meeting, and I'm sure everybody in here has gone to committee meetings where usually a lot of useful information gets passed around, but typically there's a silver-tongued orator who can dominate, or there are people who have good ideas that tend to be shy and they don't say what they've said, or sometimes the minutes by the time they come out uh, don't particularly represent what you thought you heard being said, and so in other words, um, designing in real time and then collecting some kind of record of that uh, for posterity becomes a different kinds of intellectual activities. And here what you have is a kind of online uh, committee meeting. And it's nothing more than a, than a protocol, an exchange protocol, in which there are only a certain number of um, things that you can do. Uh, <clears throat> but it does represent most of the things that you'd really want to do. Uh, there are three kinds of nodes that you can make. The highest order is an issue. That would be something close to you know saying, uh, I have this question that I want to put out. People can then attach a position, and to the position they can attach an argument. And what makes this especially useful is that you have nine relationships that you can stipulate. Within this, you um, have the text underneath in which you say what it is you actually want to say. Uh, these are types so that you know who said it and when they said it. And these ongoing webs are kept for several weeks so that you can go back and look at different versions. You can sort these proficiency and extra skills necessary for uh, success in the state or state supported education. Hypertext, I believe, and it's in hypermedia points to a four different metaphors or an in dimensional interactive environment whose features we can figure and grow to see the needs and a sophisticated user. In essence, really because of its symbiotic nature, this truly becomes what William Gibson has already uh, given us the concept really becomes the cyberspace. I'd like to thank everyone for their indulgence in sort of this flight of fantasy. And uh, I certainly hope that we'll all be able to have a hands on experience with these sort of, uh, better hyper systems well within the next couple of years. Hopefully. Uh, see more of this media yeah. in a real world environment so that we can in fact make a decision as to whether we want to, to, uh, to invest in this change. Thank you. Sure, that's fine. coming in other forms such as video. Mm -hmm. That would certainly be Marshall McLuhan's option. Marshall McLuhan didn't think the problem that we had a problem with literacy. He thought literacy was the problem. Uh, and so he simply wanted to abandon text and go to a, a totally oral world. Marshall McLuhan is not held in very high regard among scholars. Uh, I 
prefer to think that we will remain a text-oriented society, but that we will have far different, I mean, it'll be augmented and supplemented by sound and sight and, and, and smell. As soon as somebody can digitize smell, we'll have that in there too, I'm sure. Uh, but I think that we'll primarily still be driven by text Base simply because that's where we have all the information. The key is to find knowledge equivalencies. Can you, in fact, take a piece of text, run it through some kind of parser, and drop out a different knowledge representation? That's the key because no one can go back and retrofit those things if it's a handcrafted thing. Uh, the laboratory that I work at has a device that takes an aircraft maintenance manual. That's a highly formatted type of writing, okay? Parses this, runs it through a template, and drops out expert system rules with a fair degree of accuracy. Uh, and so once you say, well, I can do that, I'm wondering if in point of fact there aren't other knowledge footprints that are indigenous to some of the texts that we already have. For example, uh, defense contractors are now required to deliver their documents digitized with the standard generalized markup language within it, which is a kind of uh, uh, machine neutral formatting device. But within that, you can tell what's a heading, what's an example, so that there is a knowledge footprint in there that, that appears to have some use to it. Uh, um, again, we're just really on the forefront of what we could do with that. We, at dinner, we were talking in terms of if we have data-driven graphics, maybe we could also have text-driven graphics. And certainly we have that notion now, you can talk about a dense passage, or you can talk about a purple passage. I don't know if anybody studied literature or anything, but it's highly florid, kind of precious writing, sometimes called a purple passage. Uh, so we have that sense of wanting to see it represented in a, in a visual fashion, and yet don't quite have the, the knowledge to do that. There are some machines, there are some algorithms that present purposefully distorted representations of text so that you can see what's more important the less important thing kind of fade off in the background. It's called a fisheye view. Uh, but again, most of them, I wouldn't call them lab toys, but they're certainly not out there. I think they're not out there because nobody demands them. We just don't quite, we haven't reached enough of a, a kind of user demand or knowledge for someone to say, geez, I really need this. But the Seawolf class submarine has 500 tons of paper documents that go with it. And, and, you know, if anybody asks an argument about why would we go to virtual text, that's it right there. You couldn't even put it on the ship.